It is the perfect storm for a crisis. Money, oil, a civil war, Iran, Israel, Palestine, and the cherry on top, the United States military. The Red Sea shipping crisis is now more than two months old, and the United States' attempts to end it have not yet succeeded. But there seems to be a very simple solution. The perpetrators of the attacks, Houthi rebels in Yemen, have declared that their actions around the Bab el-Mandeb Strait are a direct response to Israel's operations in Gaza. Thus, apparently, end the war in Gaza, end the Red Sea crisis. And indeed, this prescription is the official position of Qatar, the lead mediator between Israel and Hamas. But is it so straightforward? That is the question that we are going to interrogate today. In particular, we will discuss the causal chain of events that got us here, a key practical problem that the Houthis face in trying to use the Red Sea crisis to exert leverage over Israel, thank you very much, public goods provision, and free riding, whether the United States and others can bridge that gap, a problem with the theory that predicts that the Houthis will stop once the war in Gaza ends, thank you very much, public support and recruitment incentives, and whether the United States and others can bridge that gap as well. But we begin our journey with the chain of events that brought us here to today. I suppose we could start with the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, or the initiation of the Yemen Civil War in 2014, but for the sake of tractability, we will kick things off in this video with October 7th, 2023. That was the date of Hamas's surprise attack on Israel. Fast forward 20 days, and Israel initiated a ground invasion of Gaza. This is more or less what has gone on there since then, with Israel pushing further, a brief ceasefire in exchange for hostage releases at the end of November, and a more recent suggestion that Israel may soon move to a lower intensity phase of the conflict. It is a lot to take in, but stick with me because we are only halfway there. For the second step, I suppose living on a prayer, we shift our focus all the way down to the southern end of the Red Sea, where on November 9th, the container ship Galaxy Leader was hijacked. The perpetrators were a group known as the Houthis, the rebel faction in the Yemen Civil War, but at this point, the de facto sovereign of the western portion of the country. The Houthis declared that their actions were an explicit response to the Gaza War, and that any Israeli-affiliated ships sailing through the area would be subject to attack. Basically, Houthi-Palestinian solidarity. This was the breakdown of attacks the last time that we updated the big board. Since then, the United States has led a bombing campaign on Houthi targets that started on January 12th, but has continued on since then. The United States was worried that continued Houthi assaults would risk destabilizing international trade flows. Remember, the south end of the Red Sea functionally blocks access to the Suez Canal, for all but a handful of countries. However, the flow of arms has neither deterred nor disabled the Houthis. Back to the big board. And sorry, because I need to make some more room here. We can add another missile attack on January 15th, again on January 16th, a refreshing shift to the drones on January 17th, but back to the missiles on January 18th. The following week, two ships on January 24th, though those targets were merchant marine vessels, and I have otherwise kept the US military off of this list. But not to worry, because there was another attack on the 26th. Oh, and I regret to inform you that the board is probably outdated by the time you watch this. Why do I even bother? Meanwhile, the Houthis have continued to publicly tie the attacks to Gaza. So then, end Israel's offensive, end the Houthi involvement in the Red Sea, right? Well, kind of, but not really. If I modify the question to, did the Gaza war cause the Red Sea crisis, then yes, it did, in the sense that if you take the entire month of October 2023, and erase it from the history books, then this would not be happening. But now that we are here, actually solving the problem is much harder than magical hand-waving for two reasons. 
The first problem is a practical one. Israel is not much interested in yielding on account of the Houthis. Now, this is not to say that Israel will continue the operations in Gaza forever. Remember, policymakers there are already floating the idea of transitioning to a new phase of the conflict. What exactly that means remains unclear. However, at some point, the IDF will have to switch from military administration to military containment. The broader point here is that Israel does not internalize much of a cost from the troubles in the Red Sea. October 7th represented the greatest security threat to Israel in the memories of anyone under the age of 50. Actually, Netanyahu is old enough to remember. He is 74 and served in the Yom Kippur War. There's his enlistment photo, in fact. In any case, obviously Israel is not thrilled about the prospect of its ships, or any other merchant ships, coming under attack. But that said, from the perspective of Israel's policymakers, the Red Sea issue is worth peanuts by comparison. After all, most of Israel's trade goes through the Mediterranean. Now, this should not come as a surprise. It is par for the course for international relations. All countries tend to focus on their own priorities. But to use a lines-on-map visual to represent the problem, insofar as Israel believes that Red Sea attacks will stop once the Gaza offensive is done, a point that we will return to in a moment, it makes Israel a little more compliant, though perhaps not to the extent that the Houthis wish it would. From the Houthis' perspective, this represents a critical inefficiency with their strategy, at least, again, insofar as Israel is the real priority. Despite those earlier claims that they only plan to target Israeli ships, and safe passage being offered to specific power players as well, the broader shipping market is just not buying it. Take a look at the traffic flows through the Bab el-Mandeb Strait. This is what it looked like last winter. Through the middle of December this winter, everything looked normal. But then you can see where the market lost faith, and then it continued to lose faith. And thanks again to IMF Portwatch for the data, once again reminding us that the IMF can be cool when it tries hard enough. One of the problems here is that if the Houthis intend to not target Russian or Chinese ships, or any ship that is not Israeli for that matter, then their ability to identify national origins appears to be lacking. Moreover, if national origin were to ever start making a difference, there is a deeper problem. You could just press a few buttons on your transponder to make your ship appear Russian, or Chinese if you wanted to. There are countermeasures to this, of course. But again, that presupposes the Houthis' capacity to implement them. Zooming out for a second, in the language of public goods models, and moving right past the Houthis' role in this for a second, Israel's actions have imposed a large negative externality on everyone who benefits from international shipping, which basically means everyone. Now, the problem with negative externalities is that they are, well, external. And hence the line moves by such a small degree for Israel even as others hemorrhage all sorts of money elsewhere, leaving a void in their pocketbooks. But speaking of costly problems, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Delete Me. Identity theft is a frightening thing to think about, but the good news is that there is a service out there that will help protect yourself from identity theft, while also reducing the chances that you will be doxxed, fall victim to a phishing scam, or have your data just sitting online for goodness knows whom to see. What's worse, given that we just got done talking about externalities, whenever someone buys data via a data broker, they may very well also get data about your family. But there is a solution that I can personally recommend. Delete Me. They have professional experts who know how to find where your data is being sold and how to remove the info from these data broker websites. Hey, that's a central lesson from our videos. Specialization of knowledge and economies of scale, which you can take advantage of. And look! They will send you a detailed privacy report in seven days, and then stay vigilant all year long. Plus, there is even better news. Using my special code, SPANIEL, you will get 20% off all consumer plans. Just go to joindeleteme.com slash spaniel to get started. And thanks again to Delete Me for sponsoring today's video. 
we can now address the next question. Can anyone do something to influence Israel's choice? Again, in the classic public goods framework, the solution to externalities is for those suffering from them to impose some kind of retaliatory cost on whoever is creating the problem. And setting aside any responsibilities to the Houthis here one more time, give it a minute because I swear we will revisit this topic by the end of the video, the solution here means countries like China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and the United States finding coercive levers to turn against Israel. And at some level, this may be what the Houthis want to force, though again, the roundabout nature of this makes the strategy very inefficient. China and Russia are non-starters. They have looked at this from the beginning, and basically told everyone that they were sitting this one out, both in regard to Gaza and to the Red Sea. The reason is that they have continually straddled the line between Israel and the Arab world since the end of the Cold War. Thus, the general sentiment that you get from them is, hey guys, could you please stop? At least for now. At the moment, Russia also has the extra complication of engaging in critical arms trade with Iran. This is noteworthy because all signs point to Iran supplying the Houthis. Under normal circumstances, Russia could get on the phone and threaten Iran to terminate that arms trade if Iran continues to aid the Houthis. The problem here is that Iran currently has the bargaining leverage. I know that seems backward, but it is Iran supplying Russia, not vice versa. Imagine trying to convince someone in 2021 that sanctions starved Tehran could rake Moscow over the coals. But here we are. On the scales of war, Iran is involved in a proxy battle at the moment, whereas Russia is fighting a hot war, with the latter in more desperate need of help, at least given the present circumstances. Moving on, Saudi Arabia is making some small efforts here. Remember that one of the reasons that Hamas may have conducted the October 7th attack was to drive a wedge in the normalization process between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Now Saudi Arabia is saying that the process can resume once Israel ends the war. This is a straightforward carrot to offer. It comes with some strings, but there is a ton of wiggle room in that kind of language. A pathway can always be found if you want. That leaves the United States, which seems like an awkward position given Washington's historically close connections with Israel. The geopolitical curveball here is that the United States benefits more from freedom of navigation than anyone, and thus Washington is being pulled in two opposite directions. Somewhat quietly, the United States has been trying to temper Israel's response from the start, in part because of this. The public consequence has been Secretary of State Antony Blinken traveling to Jerusalem seemingly every other week since October. You may have noticed me intentionally sprinkling in photos of him earlier. The downside is that this has left Blinken with little time to continue opening for Dave Grohl. These photos are 100% real, by the way. Side note, did you ever realize that Antony's parents literally named him Abe Lincoln? Abe Lincoln? And don't feel bad about it, because the secretary is 100% leaning into the joke. That's his band's name. Anyway, when he has not been absolutely rocking out, Blinken's message to Israel has been to take it slow and deliberate. That may be why there was that weeks-long delay between October 7th and the Israeli offensive beginning in Gaza on the 27th. But you are starting to get the feeling that Washington is growing frustrated with how Israel has handled things as operations linger on into a fourth month, even aside from whatever connection it has to the Red Sea. For the most part, the White House has taken the standard approach of supporting Israel. However, if Biden wants to take a more nuanced approach, he may have the latitude to do so. Now, polling on this seems to be happening at a glacial pace, but, that aside, back at the beginning of December 2023, 21% said that Biden was favoring Israelis too much, 16% said that Biden was favoring Palestinians too much, and 25% said that he was striking the right balance. So yes, more in favor of scaling back support to Israel than scaling back support to Palestinians, 
And bear in mind that there have been almost two months of headlines like these influencing those beliefs. Oh, and also an ICJ ruling. Look, international courts do a poor job of enforcing their rulings. We have talked about that quite a bit before. But they do influence public opinion, and that does matter. But the more interesting thing to me is the 38% who said that they did not know. Especially because they, being not in the know, are more responsive to negative headlines. In other words, Biden can likely moderate his position without causing a political upheaval in the United States. It is worth noting that there is a large partisan divide, though, with a large plurality of Democrats saying that Israel is going too far, but only a small percentage of Republicans sharing the same sentiment. This has led to discussion of how Biden is out of touch with his base and needs to revise his policy. However, appealing to his base for primary votes has little point because he has no competition within the Democratic Party of note. Instead, Biden's focus is purely on the general election and winning over that magical median voter. And that is why he has not been rushing to alter Israeli policy. The fact that right balance was the largest of the three responses indicates that he is doing a good job at that. That said, insofar as Israel indirectly affects the U.S. economy through threats to global trade, that matters a ton to Biden. Remember, in U.S. elections, it's the economy, stupid. The levers that the United States has available to push Israel are ending political cover within the United Nations Security Council, and, more importantly, limiting military aid. Some lighter form of this may already be taking place behind the scenes, with those frequent Blinken trips, as the United States would prefer to resolve the issue without forming a public rift with Israel. But again, whatever incentive the United States has here is primarily based on sensible Israeli-Palestinian policy, and not on account of the Red Sea. And that is because of the incentives that Houthis have to continue attacks, regardless of any type of ceasefire process in Gaza. To reiterate, the causal logic that the Gaza offensive led to the Houthi crisis is sensible. But the precision of the mechanism is lacking. The causal chain is missing an intermediary step. Third-party interventions in wars are commonplace, but real interventions are expensive. Superpowers like the United States are the most likely to go for it, because they have the resources to afford to be able to do so. It is not a big deal for them when sometimes that cash just vanishes. Smaller states sometimes join the fray as well, especially as part of a larger coalition, so that they can have a seat at the table. This is how you end up with a 42-country coalition countering Saddam Hussein, during the Persian Gulf War. Let me reiterate, 42 countries. Actually, that's hyperbole. 42 factorial is geometrically halfway to a Google. There, 42 countries, full stop. Also, non-superpowers may still go it alone when the war is occurring right on their borders, and they believe that a direct security threat will arise if the war outcome is not favorable. Better to engage now in a large collaboration than wait and have to go it alone. The Houthis, though, meet none of these criteria. Yemen is far enough away from Gaza that whatever happens there hardly matters for their own situation. And actually, they are still involved in a civil war, though it is currently in a ceasefire, with them controlling the major population centers, but notably a relatively small portion of total Yemen territory. The more telling thing is that the Houthis struggle to even make payroll. And that hints at the full causal relationship. It is not Gaza War, then Red Sea Crisis. It is Gaza War, then Public Outrage, then Red Sea Crisis. The Public Outrage part needs little elaboration. Arab populations region-wide are upset with Israel's offensive. And with that outrage comes a large pool of prospective volunteers and donors, some of which may be at the state level. Moreover, the Houthis have found a good time to enter this marketplace. 
all of those state-to-state -state normalizations in recent years have left few large-level outlets for supporters to go to. Hamas? Okay, very popular now with the war ongoing, but also utterly decimated due to Israel's offensive. Probably in no position to effectively use the resources that volunteers would provide. Then you have Hezbollah, and a smattering of smaller options. Fine, but again, mostly small and stale. The point is that the Houthis saw an opportunity, and they ran with it. And as much as the West would have preferred them to stay in their lane, they did not. And now their international prestige far exceeds any of those smaller groups, despite the distance. Uh, prestige in the militant sense. Okay, back to the causal chain. Ending the war only reduces the Houthis' incentive to commit attacks, insofar as it shrinks public support. Will it reduce public support? Yes, it will. And perhaps just as critically, it will stop public support from further swelling. But will it disappear completely? No. The cat is already out of the bag on that one, so to speak. And as long as there is still public support to capture, there is still a Houthi incentive to attack. That takes us to the final question. Can the United States, or anyone else, resolve this problem? The straightforward answer is yes, in the same way that Israel is trying to solve the Hamas problem by destroying Hamas's capacity. And if you see a problem with the word solve, then hold that thought for just one second. The US-led bombing operations that began on January 12th were in pursuit of that sort of resolution. However, the goal need not be the actual destruction of the Houthis. A less lofty goal is still fine. Washington just needs to put on the squeeze for this to work out. In other words, the bombing campaign could convince the Houthis that the damage done from the air attacks outweighs whatever public support there is to be gained, and thus convince them to find a way to demonstrate their commitment to the Palestinian cause that does not completely disrupt global trade. But you can see the risk here. Back to the causal chain once more. A careless operation will further expand public support, and make the problem even worse. It is the same problem that Israel is having to deal with right now, and it is part of the reason that Washington is loath to put boots on the ground. For now, it is not obvious who is winning the exchange. The Houthis appear to be betting that they will be fine afterward, otherwise they would not be trying. The US appears to be betting that the Houthis will not be fine afterward, otherwise it would not be trying. Only time will tell. If you want to know more about the broader conflict in the Middle East, check out my playlist on the subject. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care.